Hi there, everyone. My name is Prerak Juthani. I'm a third year internal medicine resident, and today I want to talk to you about a simple approach to RRTs. This is something that is very specific to hospitals, but if you're a medical student or even an intern and resident, you will know that RRTs are a very big part of the hospital, and one of the best ways that you can be prepared is by knowing what they are and ultimately how to understand and be the best team member you can be when you approach them. So with that being said, I know many of you may not know me. My name is Prerak Juthani. I'm actually an internal medicine resident. I'm planning to be a hospitalist, and what that means is I want to take care of patients when they get admitted to the hospital. I'm almost done with my residency, and while I was in residency, one of the things you get very, very acquainted with are RRTs. And I realized when I went in as an intern, it was something that was very overwhelming today to me, and now I feel very comfortable with them, and I want to teach you some of the skills that I've learned because there's not always a formal curriculum about these things. Uh, sometimes you just learn by doing, but had I had what I was going to show you now at the beginning of my intern year, it would have at least given me a few more steps to think about when I approach these sorts of things. With that being said, residency is always hard. And if you're a medical student watching this, excellent. You're going to be way ahead of the game. But if you're a resident watching this, just know that there are a lot of steps and just knowing those steps is going to put you ahead. So let's start by defining what is an RRT. An RRT stands for Rapid Response Team. Uh, the, let's break down all three of these words. Rapid means that this team comes together very fast. So when there's an acutely unstable patient, this needs to be a very fast uh, way to mobilize resources. Response means that you are responding to something and more importantly, you're going to provide a response, right? So it's not just what you're reacting to, but what you are going to provide. Um, Oftentimes, rapid response teams will be called for a wide variety of things, maybe hypotension, maybe hypoxia. And when you get there, you are responding to that hypoxic nature. But you are in, in arriving, you also are expected to provide another type of response. So if they're hypoxic, you know, work that up. How exactly are you going to approach that hypoxic patient? And how are you going to make sure they get the extra level of care they need? And team is the last part of this. Team means that there's a ton of people there. This means that there's going to be pharmacists there. There's going to be a nurse there. There's going to be a critical care nurse there. Critical care nurses are a little bit more trained for critically ill patients, so they can place IVs a little bit more quickly, and they can even help you uh, determine if you need specific labs. The whole goal of a rapid response team for the most part, is to acutely stabilize a very unstable patient and figure out the next steps in a very fast way. And this often is one of the few times in the hospital where time matters a lot. And that's why it's so important to call it appropriately, figure out what you're going to do, figure out next steps, and address the underlying trigger before they escalate. Who comes to an RRT? So that third word I told you about, which is team, implies that there's going to be a lot of people there. At my hospital, when an RRT happens, I get a page on my phone. That phone uh, reminds me and tells me, hey, this patient in this room has an RRT. Please go there right away. This patient may not even be my patient, but me as the RRT resident, I often have to go to those patients and make sure I know what's going on. There are other people who will get that same page when an RRT happens. Uh, a critical care nurse will often come to bedside. What that means, this, these are nurses who are critical, uh, trained in critically ill patients, which means they're much uh, more skilled at figuring out, hey, does this patient need the ICU? Oftentimes they can help place IVs. Uh, respiratory therapists also often come to RRTs because RRTs are often called for things like hypoxia or respiratory distress. And guess what? These individuals are experts in managing their airway. They can provide albuterol. They can provide secretion management. They can also even help provide BiPAP, which is a bi-level positive pressure machine. Okay. And, so on, and of course, you need a physician there because oftentimes that physician is going to coordinate amongst all of these individuals. I know that we talked about who comes to an RRT, but you might be wondering who calls an RRT. Let's say any, anyone has the right to call an RRT. If I go see a patient and I think this patient is very sick and they need help now, I have the ability as a physician to call an RRT. But more often than not, the people who know the patients the best and are at bedside is usually the bedside nurses. So the bedside nurses are the ones who usually call. Um, an RRT. When should you call an RRT? There's a lot of reasons. Um, the reason uh, you may know that when a patient comes into the hospital, we look at their vitals. That means we look at their heart rate, we look at their blood pressure, we look at their um, saturation on oxygen, and we also often look at their uh, respiratory rate as well as um, you know how fast they're breathing. 
a change in any of those vitals is usually enough to call in RRT, but a significant change. So for example, a significant drop in blood pressure, when a patient's blood pressure drops, that's called hypotension, that can often be enough to trigger an RRT. And I've gone to many RRTs related to high, uh, low blood pressure. Sometimes if the blood pressure is really high and the patient's having headaches and symptoms from that, that can also be the reason to call an RRT. Let's say the patient's just totally altered. This was someone who came in yesterday, they were alert and oriented, and now they're super sleepy, they have no idea what's going on. That's another reason to call an RRT. Uh, maybe they're having a stroke, maybe they're hypercarbic, maybe they're delirious, right? Um, similarly, maybe a patient's having trouble breathing. Many of you may know that in medicine, we have the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. And if someone's having trouble breathing, that is a huge red flag. If they're breathing more than 30, 40 times a minute, that's not good. Or if they require large amounts of oxygen, that's also not good. Why are they requiring so much oxygen? Or let's say they have high levels of CO2, carbon dioxide. That can often lead to narcosis, and those patients will often be very sleepy and men, um, manifest as a change in mental status. So there's a lot of reasons to call an RRT. You will never be faulted for calling one, but the important part is just know that when you call one, if you do call one, you are expected to tell the people who arrive why you called it. So oftentimes I'll arrive to an RRT. I say, hey, why was this rapid response team called? The bedside nurse will tell me, hey, this is a 72-year-old patient. I called the rapid response because he was hypotensive. Yesterday he was totally fine. His blood pressure was 120 over 80, and now he's 70 over 90. I didn't give him any new medications, but we are treating him for bacteremia, and his blood pressure is not improving at all. What should we do? Low blood pressure is a very common reason, and oftentimes we'll say, okay, what's the reason for the low blood pressure? Do we think the patient has low volume? Do we think they're septic? Do we think there's an infection that maybe we're treating but is not being appropriately treated with the antibiotics we're giving them? Or do we think maybe they have a pulmonary embolism? There's so many reasons that someone can be hypotensive. There's so many reasons why someone can have a change in mental status. There's so many reasons that someone can have difficulty breathing. But the good part is when you have all these people in the room, you can figure it out pretty quickly and go from there. So let's get to the meat of this presentation. How do you prepare for an RRT? This can be rather challenging because until you've done a lot of them, you won't you won't really realize what works and what doesn't work. But there are a few things I can tell you now that will almost inevitably give you a few steps ahead of anyone else who hasn't seen this video. When you arrive to an RRT, always introduce yourself. I, I often see this getting missed all the time. And when you don't introduce yourself, people don't know who you are, you don't know who everyone else is, and that often confounds the confusion that's already existing in a very, very complicated situation. So the first thing you could do is say, hey, my name is Prerac, I'm the resident, I'm the re rapid response resident, and I'm here to coordinate the care. Please tell me what's going on. Who is the bedside nurse? Who's the pharmacist? Uh, the bedside nurse will then talk to me. I'll ask who the pharmacist is. And then I will actually command the room in the sense that I try to figure out, okay, what's going on? Why was the RRT called? The bedside nurse tells me, hey, RRT was called for hypotension. I say, great. Uh, do we think the patient is infected? If so, what antibiotics are we giving them? They often will tell me that. Let's say the patient is not infected and is not getting antibiotics, but they look like they may have just aspirated. Maybe some of the stuff from their gastric secretions went into their airway. Well, maybe I'll then we'll ask the respiratory therapist to say, hey, can we do some secretion management? Can we try to get the secretions out? So they can help me. Um, as the RRT progresses, you're going to have a lot of conversations. The biggest thing is to always communicate. So if, if um, I say, hey, can we give two milligrams of Ativan? The nurse should then respond saying two milligrams of Ativan given. That level of communication is called closed loop communication, and that allows for effective RRT running. Okay. Similarly, once I've done a lot of interventions, I then summarize what we've done. So I say, hello, everyone. Let me just briefly summarize what's gone on in the RRT so far. It sounds like for Mr. Jones, the RRT was called for hypotension. The thought is that maybe we have early septic shock happening here. We have sent off all of his labs, including a brand new CBC, as well as a CMP and a lactate. We're going to wait for those to come back. In the, in the meanwhile, however, the blood cultures have been drawn. We're going to start him on vancomycin and cefepime, and we have also now placed in two new IVs, and if his blood pressure does not improve after giving him one liter of LR, we are going to take him to the ICU. That's a good summary, so everyone in the room knows what's going on. And the last thing in an RRT is to never be afraid to ask help. If this is an RRT for a patient that you're not aware of, just ask the bedside nurse, hey, do we have the primary team 
who is responsible for this patient available? If so, can you reach out to them and have them come by? Similarly, is there anyone else who knows a little bit more about this patient who can come by? If I think something's happening in the brain, I might say, hey, can we page neurology? These are all steps that you can take. You should never be afraid to ask for help. And so that's kind of the way I approach rapid response teams. Always introduce yourself, always summarize what you're doing, always ask if you don't know what's going on, and most importantly, if you at any point think that you don't really have a good grasp of everything, I would reach out to someone who's a little bit higher up. So whether that's an ICU fellow, maybe the primary team knows the patient a bit better than you, they can come by. But never, ever be afraid to ask for help. Let me, add, let me end now by going over some common causes of rapid response teams. I've already told you some reasons why someone may call a rapid response, but let me give you some good ideas of some of the cool rapid responses that you can go to. And oftentimes when you go to them, it's actually a very fulfilling uh, thing to do because I think you can acutely stabilize a lot of these patients and feel good about the type of care you're providing. I've been to RRTs for cardiac arrests. Patients will literally arrest. And at that point, you often have to convert the RRT to a code because oftentimes if someone has a cardiac arrest, we get very, very worried about their airway. So they need to be intubated. So we need to have anesthesia at bedside. So you escalate that up to a code. You often come to, there are RRTs where sometimes people will be complaining about chest pain. When that happens, I almost always get a troponin and make sure we rule out an acute myocardial infarction. Sometimes I get called to a bedside for an RRT for hypoxia, and I know that the patient has heart failure, and oftentimes what, what that means is they are hypoxic because there's fluid in their lungs. The heart is not doing a good job of pushing blood forward. That blood is kind of increasing the pulmonary uh, blood pressure that leads to fluid leaking out and causing pulmonary um, edema. There are other times I get called to bedside for RRT for atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate. If they're going very fast or very slow, we often need to address that. I, I often address very slow heart rate if they're symptomatic with something like atropine and a very fast heart rate if they're truly in atrial fibrillation with things like beta blockers, assuming the blood pressure is okay. We already talked about hypotension and hypertension. And of course, there's always respiratory issues for which RRTs are called. Hypoxia is a very common one when you have low levels of oxygen and require much more oxygen support, acute respiratory distress syndrome, bronchitis. Um, and one thing I wanna always mention is whenever someone calls an RRT and someone has low blood pressure, always think about sepsis. Sepsis is very early systemic signs that someone is acutely infected and it's a very big cause of mortality and morbidity. So if you truly do think someone is low blood pressure, they're looking septic, their extremities are very warm, you want to go ahead and think about starting antibiotics, giving them fluids and drying cultures, okay? So hopefully this was helpful for all of you. If it was, please drop a like. I know this is a presentation that I would have liked having as a early resident. Um, so thank you so much for watching. Again, like, comment, share, subscribe. I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.